This event tonight is particularly moving because, as some of you know, I uh, studied at UC Berkeley. It was at this museum that I graduated in. I remember the ceremony in the backyard and uh, hanging the MFA exhibition here, my very first exhibition. And it is at UC Berkeley where I got my education. And of course, Berkeley has been a home for many, many years. And um, in this room tonight, there is a few friends, um, Dennis Love, Lauren McIntosh, uh, people I went to school with who know me longer than anyone else. Um, and of course, Larry, who, Larry Rinder, who I know now for quite a long time. But also in this room, there are people who are very important to me as well. Shanusha Parsipur, the author of Women Without Men, who now lives in the Bay Area, is present. Shoja Azari, my beloved partner in life and work. And, and many other people who I'm probably not seeing yet, but uh, it's, it's very emotional for me um, to be able to share for the first time the evolution of my work at the place that educated me. And so in offering you an overview of this journey uh, that I've taken, that this history started here, uh, and in consequence of conversation that we'll have tomorrow, I thought I'd just give you a brief remarks about what have the role of education played in my work and also the untraditional nature that this journey that I've taken as an artist and my career uh, that had somehow contradicted actually the education that I gained at this school. Um, so it would be... Um, interesting to come back to. So let me take you back, and I've never done this before, this is sort of a therapeutic confessional, back to 1980s, um, well, 1970s. I was a young girl, young woman, um, from Iran. I had arrived very recently from Iran. I came to UC Berkeley with this great dream of being an artist. I was young, unsure, and naive, and very romantic and idealistic about what art is and what I want, why I want to be an artist. And unfortunately, this quickly changed as I started to study at school and without being really timid or sarcastic, it was quickly proven that I was really not a very talented artist. And I'm sure my professors had a hard time telling me that. Um, but the reality was that I actually produced very mediocre work, very simplistic, and, and um, I didn't really have a very clear vision while I was a student here. And I barely got accepted to the graduate program. And I remember that when they had a meeting very clearly from you know, the undergraduate going to graduate school and our professor, Harold Paris, came out and said, he looked at all the students and said, you got in, you got in, you got in. When he came to me, he said, and you barely got in. <laughs> and so I had had this obsession later on. Why? Um, why didn't I do at, good at school, um, aside from the fact that I was very young and unprepared and immature? Is that something that I didn't have the gift uh, or talent, or is there something wrong with the school that couldn't help me with the education that I needed to blossom like other people did? And my explanation has been that there's a little bit of both. That is true that I obviously didn't have the intellectual or even mental maturity as a 20-year-old to make important work, make important contribution. Um, and the reality also is that my personal life circumstances, why I was at school, was very complicated. Um, Quickly after I came to Berkeley, the Islamic Revolution happened in 1979. Um, right after that, there was the war with Iraq. And as I began to study, um, I began to lose contact with my family without being melodramatic. Like many people got separated from their loved ones, and it was extremely dangerous and to travel back. And mind you, I was only 20-something years old, completely depended on my family financially and morally, and I found myself experiencing a huge loss uh, at a country that I didn't really know very well. I barely could speak English. Um, and, and that I felt um, 
completely abandoned. Uh, on top of it, to make things more complicated, the American hostages were taken in the Iranian em American embassy in Iran. And I remember very well on this campus, there was a huge, strong antagonism against the Iranian students. I was one of them. And, and that just sort of helped further corner me as a human being emotionally and politically and not really feel that I was able to participate in the education or even feel like a member of the community other than my immediate friends who, who were extremely supportive. Uh, and nevertheless, the, the years that I remember at Berkeley were undivided from the turbulent time of my country and a beginning of my anxiety uh, as a person. So what happened was after I graduated, I decided to, to go to New York. And if I had any doubts about the difficulty of being an artist or the, the pursuit of an art career, it was completely terminated in New York as I arrived and it was a city that immediately intimidated you as an artist. Uh, it was extremely competitive. Uh, I felt overwhelmed by, by this environment and I, I just decided, you know what, I'm I'm not talented and I'm not interested in having this career, so let me just go on and having my life. So I took on jobs and luckily for me, I began my um, work with the organization called the Store Fund for Art and Architecture. Um, an extraordinary organization that it's not for profit. Uh, it was a laboratory that brought together artists, architects, cultural critics, scientists, all kinds of people of creative imagination to intellectual capacity. And I believe it was here in, in this um, particular place that I got the education that I needed. And now coming back to Berkeley, I remember that the emphasis here was let us, like, all art schools, which I have today, a big problem. Let us dis detect the talents of each student. Let us help them to, to develop that into being something bigger, a style, uh, and that could be somehow developed to be repeated a number of times and eventually by the time the student is out of the school could enter galleries and museum and have a professional career. And, and I guess I find that system entirely flawed as I don't believe that people as young people are born with gifts or talents. That I don't believe is something that you, you have in your intuition that a teacher can just sort of bring it out of you. That opposite, I feel that art is something that is seeked in life and that unless you, you, you go after it or also art is partially related to knowledge and intellectual information. So I think now, Going back to storefront, that's exactly what it gave me. Uh, having taken a back seat as an artist, I was really keen on helping other artists, organizing exhibitions, books, conferences. And through their work, I began to develop my own identity as an artist, the need for research, information, uh, and, and finding meanings in art, things that, the process, et cetera. But yet I didn't have a subject that was so urgent or pressing for me until I went to Iran in, finally, in 19, 90. So mind you, I, I, I moved to New York about 1983 and I went to Iran and my professional career started in 1993. So there was 10 years of absolute no activity. Now, why I went back to art was my profound experience in returning to Iran after 12 years and, and that somehow I couldn't approach comprehending and finding a form of communicating what I was experiencing with Iran other than visual vocabulary. And it was then that I realized, well, maybe I am an artist at the end. But when I came back and I went frequently to Iran and the work began to develop, I found my own methodology. I, I found that I was no longer interested in art history, in finding models, other heroics, artists. Um, I pioneered my own way. I was not, unlike school, which teaches you to be faithful to a particular medium and get really good at it, I've been totally unfaithful to every medium. I took a lot of risk and, and I had no particular ambition or strategy of how I was going to take on this career. It just one thing led to the other. So if I really have to now go back to now is 2013, my professional 
career started in 1993. 30 years later, if I had to really focus on central important thing to discuss my work is in fact the transitional, the nomadic behavior of my work. And then again, I look at myself and I say, what's wrong with you? Why so much change? Are you so brave? Are you so gifted or ambitious? And the truth is that now I can reflect back and realize that I'm none of the above, that the truth is the transitional behavior of my work is a reflection of my personality. That if you really get to know me, I'm a very nervous person, I'm very restless, I'm very anxious, I can never do anything for very long. And in terms of my lifestyle, it's been a nomadic lifestyle. I have been a traveler, a nomad ever since I've known myself. I've never been able to stay at the same place for very long. I've never even been any place for very long that everybody looks like me and speaks the same language. Reinventing myself, new beginnings, adapting to new environments, new cultures, new languages, new smells has been a way of life. And in fact, I enjoy the idea of being a student and new beginning because somehow it makes me feel like I'm growing and I'm relevant and that I'm on the edge and that most of all that I'm struggling. And I say this because I'm hoping there will be some students here because because the business about art and everyone telling us that we should constantly make masterworks and, and succeed. I learned throughout my career that I've made some good work, very bad work, mediocre work, but I've never been afraid of taking risk and failing. Now, having said all this confessional stuff, there are a lot of changes in my work, but there's also some things that have never changed, whether I've been, and I'm talking about, by the way, these transitions have been still photography, to video, to cinema. I've also experimented with performance art, and some of which we'll discuss tomorrow. But what has been consistent in my work, which I go over and over again to remind my friends, so when you look at my work, please keep this in mind, aside from the nomadic part, that my work is deeply personal, that very often um, there's this conception that my work or myself, I'm an ambassador, the speaker of the Iranian culture or the Muslim world. Uh, it's not at all. My work is conceived from a single person's perspective, someone who's been outside of her own country, and it's really for me to delve into my own personal and social anxieties. And um, every character, every narrative that I seem to approach, it is an extension of who I am. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, and Finally, uh, I think the question of the political, if you think about every Iranian artist, I think it's political one way or another. I think being Iranian, you don't find the moral political option to distance yourself from the the question of politics. If you're living in Iran, you're of course subjected to absence of a freedom of expression, uh, censorship, harassment, and if you're living outside, someone like myself is forced to a life in exile. And so whether we like it or not, our, our work is informed by the reality of the life that we live in. And I think this is very unlike the Western artists that the being political is often a choice. Now, the poetics, if you think about Iran, there are two things that come loud and clear, politics and poetry. We are people who are divided between our history of mystics and poets and, and, and artists um, and every, you know, fantastic minds versus a reality, a very, very dark history of fanatics and dictators and, and oppressors. And, and this work that I do has always a footing in poetry and a footing in politics. So the poetic language being, of course, the most subversive way of communication has been a way that all Iranian people have found a, a kind of affinity. And finally, I think, is the question of paradoxical. Everything that I do seems to be working in the form of, of opposites, whether it's the masculine or the feminine, the spiritual or the violent. Visually, even, is about black and white and magic and realism, etc. So I want to, to keep these elements in mind. I will share with you very quickly the evolution of the work, again, from the still photography to video to film, and back to you with your questions that hopefully will surprise me. Um, so. Woman of Allah was the very, very first group of work that I did. Um, 
Let me see if I can get this to be full. Okay. Um, it was clearly, uh, this was a, on the subject of the Islamic Revolution. I was fascinated by this issue of martyrdom, the concept that is often sort of identified with terrorism. I was very, very um, focused on understanding those men and women that voluntarily put themselves at the risk of death and also cruelty to others on the name of faith and, and devotion to their religion. So um, this group uh, actually became a series. It actually started in 1993 and ended in 1997. I collaborated with a friend of mine. I often Pose for it myself, and the main component of this series became the veil, which is very important considering the, the condition of women in the Islamic world, uh, clearly suggesting a boundary, um, and uh, the weapon, suggesting, reflecting the, the, the violence of the Islamic revolution, the text that was poetry by Iranian women, and, and the female body, that is also extremely controversial. Um, and I want you to know that at this point, I'd never even owned a camera. I had never, in uh, Berkeley, I had uh, been a painter and printmaker. By the way, I destroyed all the passwords, so you can never find evidence of it. <laughs> so you know me now as a photographer, but in reality, I started as painting. Maybe Lauren remembers a few bad paintings. Um, but anyway, um, so I collaborated uh, with a photographer, and then I took the negatives and started working with it. Um, but as you can see, that this work were inspired by photojournalism. They were very sculptural. They were highly posed, highly stylized, and and um, um, also, it's important to say at this point, not having lived in Iran for 12 years, I was approaching this as almost like a tourist, uh, looking back to Iran, trying to come to terms with issues and ideas that I had been missing while I was in the United States. Again, the Islamic Revolution and the foundations of the, and I, in my mind at the time, the, the concept of martyrdom became the very foundation of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, and as you can see, that the, the woman figure, there is eroticism that comes with the female body once is encountering the, the, the weapon, etc. Uh, the calligraphy is something that I'm not uh, trained in. I eventually taught myself to, to you know, write uh, on directly on the photographs. Uh, this began in 1993. By 1995, I was somehow discovered. I showed in the Venice Biennial, and I started to have exhibitions, and uh, people started to like this. But as people started to like those, I left photography altogether. Uh, and again, being the rebellious as I am, I, I, the minute I felt that I was identified as this signature artist that made these photographs with writings on it, I decided to go completely against it. I've had a long infatuation with the moving picture. And, and for um, just when I started to actually earn money for those photographs, I took a little money and I started to make videos. Turbulent was the beginning of a new world for me, uh, a piece that is is in double projections and two opposite sides. It was also the beginning of my encounter with Shoja Azadi, who's here. He is the singer in this film. Uh, it was a piece that was, uh, I think at once was actually exhibited at this museum, is two projections on two opposite walls, and the viewers were sitting in uh, watching them, uh, sort of a duet. Uh, um, so they were not only a witness, the audience were literally a participant of this piece. Um, so what came out of the video was um, getting away from the photography but bringing the aesthetic value, the black and white, the sculptural um, sort of aesthetic of um, that. Uh, and yet now we had music, we had a sculptural experience, we had uh, element of performance, a beginning, middle, and the end. Um, this became a, a new beginning for me, the idea of leaving the studio art and going out into the world and beginning to collaborate to, to, to put myself in situations where now I was beginning to direct. Um, this was in uh, Rapture that you saw. It was actually shot in 1999. Uh, it was shot in Morocco, and it was really the most ambitious project I'd ever done. Uh, we hired a group of 100 women, 100 men, uh, and local people. We paid them a little money. Um, the, the 
the story of Rapture was, as you could see, it was a little bit like creating a dance choreography, simply a movement of a hundred women in black on one side, two opposite projections versus a group of white-shirted men on the opposite and their interaction together, very similar to um, Turbulent. If Turbulent basically in concept question the, the premise of the situation of women in relation to music and how women were deprived of the experience of music while the men actually could sing. Um, here, and, and actually Susanne Dehim did fantastic music that broke all rules of uh, traditional music. She continued to work with me and in this uh, film, Rapture, we took this idea of the masculine and feminine further and, and now brought this question of women in relation to nature and men in relation to culture. Again, I, I frame certain important sociological issues, but try to create somewhat of an allegorical poetic uh, fiction or a sort of a narrative that could um, raise those issues. Uh, I enjoyed this piece tremendously because uh, it really had this theatrical uh, aspect to it that was unlike anything else I've done. And yet every single frame of this video, as you could see, was conceived as a photograph. So I felt like I, my photographs were beginning to move, but now I had music, I had choreography, I had theater, and a story, a slight story. Um, the third film that sort of created the trilogy with Turbulent and, and uh, Rapture was Fervor, which further examined this question of, of sexuality, masculine and feminine, but this time was really about temptation, temptation for opposite sex, and how it's extremely tabooed in certain cultures, and particularly in the Islamic culture in Iran. And so as the previous two films, this film was also highly stylized. This is not realism. This is fiction, but also inspired by the, the scenes that you have, for example, in the Friday prayers in Iran, where women and men are divided by a curtain. Um, here, this man and woman who initially encountered each other in privacy saw each other in this public event and as they were sort of quietly flirting, they were faced by a man who seemed like almost like a mullah or also could be a, a, an actor that was preaching them about the story of Yusuf and Zuleikha, which basically tells every good Muslim to restrain themselves from um, from the, the, the idea of temptation and committing sin. Anyway, this film was uh, again, very uh, much like the um, previous film, very black and white and very beautiful camera work, um, all shot in Morocco. Um, in 19, no, in 2001, uh, something dramatic happened. I got asked by Philip Glass, and the reason I'm speaking rather fast, because I have made so much work, and I don't want to get into too many details. You can, you're always welcome to ask me questions later, but I just want to give you a taste of uh, some of these projects uh, to take you to the present. Uh, Passage was a, a project that was an invitation by Philip Glass, the wonderful American uh, minimalist composer, where he uh, asked me and a few other artists to make videos that then he played live in concert. It was a tremendous opportunity to now conceive an idea uh, in collaborating with a Western uh, artist, a composer, uh, who was not from my part of my world and did not really, um, I didn't share very many things with him in the past. Um, so I came up with a narrative that essentially evolved around a, a fictional funeral, uh, a corpse that was being carried by a group of men um, to the desert and eventually was buried by the woman. Um, this piece became um, really inspired by some of the issues that I was facing at the time, the passing of my father, the political turmoils in the Middle East. Uh, I was inundated with the issue of mortality and, and sorrow and loss. Uh, so I discussed with Philip and I uh, made this piece and he made uh, fantastic music for it that was equally um, melancholic. Um, and um, the elements here, obviously you see nature is in color uh, while the people are remain in black. Uh, like Rapture, I see this piece almost like a dance choreography. 
to buy the piece uh, now talking about nomadic. Uh, now I moved to Mexico from Morocco, uh, where we shot tuba that was created right after September 11th. Uh, the tree of tuba, uh, which Shanush Parsipur is here, has referred to in a number of her books. It's a tree in paradise. Uh, it's a, a very important symbol for us. It's a feminine symbol. Um, and in um, I actually created this in reference to the September 11th, uh, this obsession that we had with the lack of security that we had, with this idea that all of us, in a way, were looking for an idea of safety and security. And in both Persian and Islamic tradition, the idea of our, um, a garden, the tree of Tuba, it's, it's something that is, represents the idea of freedom and refuge. So we, together with Shoja and many of my colleagues, went to Mexico and tried to identify a single tree in the middle of a hill that looked like Iran, and then we built the garden, uh, and a group of uh, men and women in black basically ran toward it to take uh, refuge. Um, it was... Um, it was a tremendous project, uh, a tremendous experience to translate some of the allegorical ideas that I felt to something that happened in the global scale to all of us, especially living in New York. Uh, this was a piece that I showed in Documenta in 2002. Soliloquy was another double channel projection that I shot in Turkey. So as you can see, now I'm moving on from place to place. Um, this piece was also about notion of opposite, but this time about cultures, not just about the masculine and feminine nature and culture, but uh, it was really an um, sort of an autobiographical piece about myself, a woman that being divided and standing sim simultaneously at the threshold of East and West, modernity and, and traditional. So we actually shot in Mardin, in the country in Turkey, and in in United States, we shot in Albany and the World Trade Center. And the architecture was used in a great deal in a way of representing the values, the, 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 the both the power and the, the problematics of each country. Uh, and uh, at the end, um, well, okay, now I'm moving quickly to Women Without Men. Uh, after making a number of video installations, as you could see, double projections having gone from the photography, and people had identified me as a black and white photographer with calligraphy, and now people were saying, ah, oh, she's this artist who makes these double channel projections. I decided that I had to take a leave of absence from the art world. I've been very active in biennials, exhibitions, etc., and I felt this sense of exhaustion. Uh, and I decided to, to take a next turn, which is to move towards cinema. And at this point, I had no previous uh, experience with cinema, but I knew that was no way for me to stop myself from making this drastic um, the turn as people were beginning to recognize my work, etc. The question was, what story would I turn into a film? And after afterwards, I'd never even written anything. And so Women Without Men, as I told you, the author is here, is a magnificent piece of literature that most Iranian people know. It was written in uh, 1990s. It's a, literature of magic realism. I love this story because just like my other work had a footing in allegorical, poetic, mystical ideas, and yet it was grounded in reality in 1953 in Iran. I felt that for the first film, it was a perfect opportunity to create a rather conceptual film that was both artistic and narrative, both mystical and political. So I took the liberty together with Shojo Azari, took Shahnoush's book, and took about six years to, to take this book, readapt it into script. Eventually, we went to Morocco. The film was a German, German, French, Austrian production shot in Morocco by Iranian-American directors. Uh, it was a tremendous education, and needless to say, this film is not perfect, but it was a genuine effort in um, making a film by a visual artist. Uh, what also is significant to say that the things that I really appreciated in the allegory of this film was the way that Shahnush created this orchard that at once represented and 
the a space that is completely ephemeral. It's a place that is outside of history, timefulness. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a space of universality. Uh, it's almost like a place after death. Uh, it's, if you could think of human body, to me the orchard was the inner body of a person. Where we, When you came to the city of Tehran, it was reality, it was history, it was it was uh, politics, uh, and, and, and it was the exterior, the, the skeleton of human body. So again, I took this uh, and, and some of the characters that Sharnush had created, for example, Zarin, a prostitute, uh, and I, I think you can rent this now at Netflix or Amazon.com, which gives me a great pleasure to say that I moved, uh, I pushed away from the galleries of uh, gallery and museum walls now into the world of theater, uh, the film festivals, producers, etc. And for me, this was an incredible uh, challenge to see that I can not only change spaces, but I can also change audiences. And so going back to the characters, uh, Shahnush's fantastic imagination brought also these incredible characters. Some of them were very magical. Some of them were really realistic. Um, and, and here is one of my favorite favorite characters is Zarin, who is a prostitute who is inundated with feeling of shame and, 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 and sort of sin from prostitution. And she began to go mad and started to see her clients headless, which we made faceless. It was impossible to make men headless. <laughs> and Shanush knows we tried everything. And so at the end, we actually brought uh, a Hungarian actress who never spoke a word of Farsi and never spoke in the film. That, to me, became the most mystical uh, character of the film. Uh, Shahnush herself actually played the madam in the film. Uh, and, and so we created all the sets in Morocco to resemble Iran in the 1950s. It was a tremendous effort by a large team of people, again, from all over the world, particularly the Iranian team. But as you can see, that every frame even of this film created like a tableau so it was careful um, attention was played um, to the visual to the aesthetic of the film but not undermining the narrative the pacing the character studies that is so significant in the language of cinema uh, and that was why it took this film six years to be made um, these are all coming from Shahnush's um, um, story of course when I first read her book and she described Zarin who who I guess I can't even remember what is about the book and what I did. Shanush, was she anorexic in your book too? She wasn't, right? No. <laughs> Well, I decided to bring this character as the most mystical, the most torturous character. So I brought, um, and actually, to be honest, I didn't know that or she, this actress, was as thin as she was. But but eventually, um, we. But she had these fantastic scenes of this uh, woman praying in the in the bathhouse, and I knew that one day I will recreate that bathhouse. Um, but what I guess she didn't know that the actress would be uh, anorexic and that she would be bleeding. Uh, it was, uh, uh, again, these are some of the shots that uh, the orchard that we created. Um, the second character was Faize, a woman that um, basically was mostly traditional Muslim woman that became raped. And the rape basically broke all her source of morality. And eventually, she took refuge um, in this orchard uh, with the other woman, where they created a sense of utopia to take time out of the society, where eventually she found a way to recuperate from her suffering. Um, this was Farouk Lara, uh, the most realistic uh, character of the film. That was a woman of coming to age, a woman in her 50s that wanted to start life over again. She left her husband. She wanted, I think Shahnush often wrote about women in Iran at certain age that were inspired by the idea of the f French salons and intellectual artistic life. So she came to uh, pioneer a new life in the orchard. And um, uh, mind you, 1953, it's a mystery to most Iranians and that even I think to Iranians and also to the Western world that mostly know us since the Islamic Revolution. And it was tremendous opportunity for us as artists to revisit our country prior to the Islamic Revolution and to the way we dressed, the way mu music that we listened to, the cultural life that we had. And, and I mind you that uh, in Shahnush's book, the 1953 coup was simply in the background, but myself and Shojo Azari brought it to the forefront as I'm always interested in intersecting politics into my more lyrical work. 
And in fact, the conceptually, I thought it was very beautiful to compare, even if allegorically, the fact that the woman took refuge in the orchard to look for an idea of freedom and democracy and, and independence from the men. And the country of Iran was also going through the turmoil and, and the and, and independent from independence from the foreign intruders. And so the country was almost treated as a fifth character. And to me, that was um, a, a very conceptual approach. Back to Farouk Lera, um, she basically owned the orchard and brought the other women together and basically became the mother almost of all these women. Munes was also the, one of the more magical uh, characters, a woman who had a dream of becoming an activist. Her dreams were beyond just her own narcissistic ideas of life, children, marriage, but social activism. But because her family didn't allow her, basically she killed herself, she committed suicide, and only in death she was resurrected and able to, to revisit life as she dreamed. Um, and um, these are some of the shots. Uh, as you can see, everything, including the demonstrations, were highly stylized. They were not realistic. Uh, and, and, and in a way, I think we were trying to find, even in the film world, our own signature, our own way. If there are other artists who have tried to infuse art and cinema, uh, and they have gone about it in different degrees, like Julian Schnabel went 100% into making conventional film, where I think Steve Steve McQueen pretty much did, um, where Matthew Barney went mostly artistic way. I think I met halfway cinema, uh, art and cinema. And so um, the story was um, comprehensible, but it still was very artistic. And uh, the producers were very important to them that it was also a film that was able to do well in the box office. Uh, the film eventually did well. It, it did get an award at the Venice Film Festival. I got the best director and eventually got the distribution. Um, and, and mind you, this was one of the most difficult um, projects I've ever undertaken, but it one that I would like to do again. Uh, after six years of taking an absence of uh, art practice, I went back to making art in 2012. I, f I held uh, my first photographic exhibition. Uh, I went back to black and white portrait um, photography with calligraphy on it. I guess after large teamwork, big productions, I missed the idea of using my hands, the idea of going after human portraits, um, the simplicity of studio work. Uh, and um, this series um, called The Book of Kings, it's a very large group of photographs that are basically evolving around the Arab Spring and the Green Movement. My experience and my uh, reflection on what happened in Iran and the Arab world, uh, and the, the wonderful energy that we saw come from the youth, uh, the, the sense of patriotism and courage and self-sacrifice uh, that was all inundated with violence, atrocity, and oppression that came right after with the governments in various uh, places. Uh, I went back to the simplicity of the body language, simple body postures here, the Pledge of Honor, a uh, sign of love of country. Um, again, very controlled gazes um, and, and um, um, direct contact with the, the lens. Uh, having come from cinema now, I was able to speak to the, uh, the characters that I shot from the Arab world, from Iran, to be able to grasp certain emotions out of them that should, sort of express their anxiety of mortality, yet the sense of dignity and pride that they felt for, for what they were doing, which usually comes with being young and fearless. I myself at this point have become quite active, like Shahnush, like Shoja, like many other people in this room, during the Green Movement, something really shifted for us, and, and we were not um, passive anymore, and we found ourselves in protest. We were in hunger strikes together, together with Sharnush and others, uh, and and so we felt a part of this movement. Uh, and I started to go to Egypt uh, with Shoja in preparation for our next film. So I was able to actually be present in the Tahrir Square uh, and really see if I couldn't go to Iran. Now I was able to experience this incredible energy, this sense of euphoria before my eyes in Egypt. Um, and there are a large, large number of work, uh, work. Now, having come from Women Without Men, that taught me the importance of looking back at history and seeing how history repeats itself. I thought it was fascinating to go back to the Book of Kings from 10th century, the, the, the book of uh, epic 
uh, poems by Ferdowsi that, once again, it's about the stories of patriotism, courage, self-sacrifice, but yet killing brutality and atrocity. And so I took literally uh, these uh, this illustrations uh, from the Book of King, and, and I sort of we painted them over the, the figures. So this is about the Iran past and the present, allegory, poetry, and yet hardship and suffering and dictatorship that seems to repeat itself over and over again, regardless of what period we're talking about. So again, I went back to my own poetic images, but always informed by history. Uh, and these figures obviously suggest ideas of the villains, people who held the powers, and so in their bodies, I purposely painted the paintings of illustrations of the Book of Kings, which is the illustrations of war. Then in Egypt, um, having been there, and now I've been spending quite a bit of time there studying Egyptian history, and I'll explain to you soon why. To close this chapter of the Book of Kings, I thought it was important to now visit the elder, the elderly, the people who perhaps for the, the parents or the people who were related to those who willingly lost their lives for their country. And ironically, women of Allah also focus on the notion of martyrdom. But if you remember, those were about people of religion, people who gave their lives because of their faith to religion or the ideology. The Book of Kings was focusing on another group of people, another generation of people who were martyrs, but this time not for the religion, but for their country, for the idea of democracy. And, and this was an incredible change. As you look at the faces of the youth that I showed you, they're all representative of educated, forward-looking people, people who are not ideological, basically. And so at the end, this whole evolution has turned a bad page, and it's been feeling of despair and defeat. So in my own way, I wanted to now go back to my portraits and allow the people for the first time to let go. And I did a whole series of tears of people who actually I photographed right off the Tahrir Square in November. And these are just my sketches that are now being finished. But basically, I, I recruited older men and women who have had some sense of loss or tragedy immediately after or during, the, during this upheaval. Evil. And I basically I spoke to them, and there's another secret that the photographer that I work with happened to also lose his. He's American uh, photographer, lost his 22-year-old daughter in August. So the, together with Shoja and him, we went to to Egypt and we tried to set up a studio by Tahrir Square near there, and we brought these beautiful men and women, and we tried to tell them how our friend Larry, and how me as an Iranian, we also carry so much grief and so much tragedy in our personal lives and our national loss. And we wanted to share with them and we wanted to capture their experience and their sense of loss. And if they could convey that to the camera and let go. And they cried and Larry cried and I cried. And we made this beautiful, well, I don't know if they're beautiful, they're just very touching because they're real people, they're extremely poor. And, and these are working class people that are not not um, actors, and, and they are really emotions that conveys their true experience of loss in Egypt. Um, and so we are working on this in my studio now, and I'm working uh, very differently with calligraphy now. Um, and these are one of the pieces, for example, that is finished. Now, if you want to, uh, if I hope you have not exhausted you, I have two more little projects to go back to video installation. Now, see, I'm making all the way back, um, I have, I was invited to make a video with Natalie Portman. Just when I decided I wasn't going to do photographer or video, I got a commission and uh, from France um, by uh, Dior, who, um, you know, as some of you might know, uh, Natalie Portman is Miss Dior. But this is not advertising. Um, they asked that she had expressed interest for me and her collaborate in a video together. And this would be a work that would be commissioned by them. I, I thought it was really interesting. First of all, I admire her a great deal as an artist, uh, but also that she's born in Israel. And I know that she's been very religious. We met and we talked about ideas and how we could come up with a piece that could do justice in regard to who she is and 
what I am. And, and so together with her and Dariush Khonji, one of the greatest living cinematographers who's Iranian French, who has shot Haneke's Amour, a number of fantastic films, we came up with a video that is actually almost done. I have not shown it yet. I was almost going to sh use you as an example and show you that video, but I was too scared because I thought, oh, maybe they'll hate it and then they'll put a damper on it. Um, but this is really um, just a little bit far from being done, um, but it hasn't been shown. But um, so this video, it's really, uh, it's about something very existential. It's almost like a dream. It's my own dreams. Um, it's really a number of times that I've gone back to, to seeing um, this space of abyss, this idea that I always go back over and over again to an angel of death that somehow wants to keep pulling me to the abyss and I try to keep bringing myself up to the light. So we created a piece about the psychological breakdown of a woman who no longer knows if she or he, uh, she is in a dream or a reality. And that her, um, um, so actually in order to do that, we studied a lot Maya Dare and we also studied um, surrealist um, um, films by Man Ray and others who have used glass um, to play with this idea of vision. Um, and so this is a silent film, there's no talking, um, but it really de relies on e extreme uh, psychological performance by an actor. And, and it's funny because only later I realized that Natalie Portman actually played in Swan Black Swan, which is very similar to that, that, you know, she, uh, what happens was uh, here she begins to think she's going mad and she follows this man that she sees uh, and she, she, in order to see if she's going insane or not, uh, she, she follows him and he takes her to a space that is the space of underworld and in there she's able to see herself, herself as very different kinds of being, demonic, kind, vulnerable, etc. So uh, again, this is like a 10 minute, uh, uh, very, very minimalistic uh, film uh, that has very sort of minimal sounds. There's hardly any music, there's no music. Um, and it just plays with this um, boundary between illusion and, and this illusion, the conscious, subconscious, dream and reality, uh, and the experience that every one of us have that we are wondering if we're losing our mind, uh, and, and the anxiety and fears that we often take to our dreams. I remember very well Shanush Parsipur. Often I ask her why she writes so much about magic and realism. So much of her literature takes place in surrealism. And she says, because we spend so many hours on our dreams, dreams are a form of reality for us, but we only talk about reali reality, not our dream. And, and I wanted to make a, a piece that somehow blurs this boundary. Um, and so this is the outcome. Hopefully one day I'll show it very, you know, somewhere soon. There, in, there is no immediate deadline. Um, but I've enjoyed it tremendously because, um, you know, to work with a person like her who has that gift of performance, uh, it's really extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. Uh, and the cinematography is quite grand. Uh, and so it goes back to almost rapture in the way that the simplicity of, of black and white, the choreography, etc. I know I've exhausted you, but I have one last thing to tell you, which is perhaps the most ambitious thing yet I have taken on together with the help of Shoja, who should take credit with absolute everything I've ever done since um, since uh, Turbulent. Um, Omar Kulsum is the most legendary artist of the 20th century in the Islamic world. I happen to be that she's a woman, and I love that. I think this would surprise a lot of the people in the West that somehow sort of Imagine the, 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 the world of the Arab world, the Muslim world, always infinitely, infinitely barbaric and backwards. And it gives me a great pride to say, well, you know what, it wasn't like that. Uh, we've had a very rich culture. And not only that, we had a female singer that was loved by men, by women, by the religious, non-religious, by the wealthy, the intellectual, and that 
She, unlike many Western singers, never had a dip. She never had a tragedy. She, she never, of course, she had tragedies, but she never had a tragic ending. She was not alcoholic. She didn't commit suicide. Her music is known to put people in the state of ecstasy, and yet she was a nationalist. So again, it's this perfect paradox: a woman who's an artist who operates on your emotions, in your spirituality, in mystical ideas, and yet is grounded in reality, history, nationalism. She worked very closely with the monarchy, King Farouk, but also very closely with Nasser, the social revolution. If anything, the Egyptians agree today, if they're divided according to the fundamentalist versus the secular, is Omakosum. They unanimously love Omakosum. I think it's an incredibly relevant subject. Shoja and I have done lots of trips to Egypt. We have met with her family. We have read every book. We have done every interviews. And we have a team of Egyptians and Iranians uh, working on the script. Um, and, and nevertheless, it's the scariest project ever, because now I'm going to be working in Egypt in a language that I don't know. Uh, I am, um, you know, it's, it's a quite a scary thing to allow yourself to make a film about such an icon who even in Egypt Egyptian hasn't yet tried. So um, it, now we have producers. Uh, we believe it or not, two and a half years in, in process. Uh, we are hoping to shoot in 2014. Uh, and maybe it will come out in 2015. But sorry to tell you so much. This is the end of my journey. Uh, and I just couldn't help but to give you a little flavor. Uh, and I just wanted to pause now and ask you for your questions. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about your relationship to the women that you worked with in Morocco in the film uh, Miracle. It, is it Rapture? The, the question is the, the woman that played in Rapture. Um, actually, this woman uh, were basically uh, worked on this film because they needed the money. Uh, basically, um, Esauvera is the town where we shot. Uh, they're extremely poor. And we put a casting, we put a call for casting. We explained to people that this was what the story was about, that basically they could maintain the hijab, that we were not trying to, um, to, to undo who they are. But this story is not about Morocco, it's about women in Iran. That is purely a poetic film. It's not a political film. Basically, we fed them, we paid them, we danced together. I remember we had a wonderful moments. We spent a few days with the woman alone, a few days uh, with the men. Eventually, when we went back to work on other films, we recruited the same woman again. And I remember Shoja working in another film, and they worked with him as well. So we have had a long history. This is all in the incredible town of Esauvera, where Orson Welles once shot Othello, I believe. But it was a very wonderful, decent, respectful collaboration. Everybody's scared. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your phenomenal overview of your work. I was wondering if um, you could speak a little bit about the photographs that you've made more recently. The, um, I was wondering if the Book of Kings project is separate from the one of the parents who are crying in the photographs. Um, so if you could talk about that a little bit. And I was also wondering if those photographs, the ones with the tears, if there's writing also on those ones. Oh, and I, where I thought, the writing is I from. I thought you saw them. There were tiny little writings everywhere. <laughs> Maybe I can't see very well. Yeah, Sorry. no, no, it's, you have to see close up. Um, these are the ending of the book. Uh, for me, um, this is all one, one body of work the Book of Kings, uh, the Patriots, uh, and then the, the villains. Uh, and then we had the masses, and, and this group of people, to me, uh, it's like when I created the trilogy of turbulent rapture and fervor. Together they create one work. And uh, for me, this is the last chapter. Uh, sadly, a very uh, um, kind of melancholic one. Um, but to me, this sort of belongs to that group of photographs. Uh, and the writing, uh, I forgot to mention the original text that we use on the Book of Kings was poetry by contemporary Iranian poets. These ones are Arabic poets. Uh, we particularly use like Mahmoud Darvish from Palestine, all kinds of uh, poetry that sort of uh, speaks about the sense of loss, again, national loss versus, and 
personal loss, but their incredible amount of writing. Each work, each photograph takes days and days to finish. Hi, thank you. Eid Shuma Mubarak. It's our New Year's tomorrow and tonight, <laughs> so it's a very special day. Thank you so much. I, I think what you do so wonderfully is balance the um, allegorical with the narrative component, the poetic and the literal. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the process that you took to get to a place where you have that really delicate balance so that the, the viewer really sinks into the piece and isn't kind of moving back and forth between poetic and re realistic and is kind of in this really beautiful space of being with the piece. I think that's a really hard balance to strike. So if you could talk a little bit about that process, I'd appreciate it. Well, I always saw, um, first of all, it's not just me. I think the reason Iranian people have depended so much on the poetic language in films, in all kinds of ways, art artistic uh, work, is because in many ways, it's not only a way to transcend censorship, um, but it's a way to, to delve deeper into humanity and ideas of mysticism, ideas that it's so deeply primal that uh, it truly becomes accessible for all people, that it sort of uh, transcends our differences. And I, I think for someone who is so careful about making work that is personal, that is existential, that is emotional, versus work that is also important in terms of political, social meanings and historical meanings, um, the poetry uh, neutralizes, helps me neutralize the, the political information of the work and allows the viewer not to feel so distant from it because I think all of that other information, people feel like it's some kind of a, a you know, it's just too ethnographic. For me, this is the way I can reach the humanity of, of the people that I'm speaking about. Uh, I think in nature, allegory, metaphor, symbolism, uh, it's it's a way that it's the most universal way of communication and and I think that's lucky for Iranian people we've had so much censorship that allegory has been very useful for us to get used to Hi, um, I come from a long distance from Iran, and I'm artist. And it was uh, my good choice that I could see you. And it was uh, very. Now I'm a little bit in, um, exciting, because it was my dream to see you and to uh, meet you. Um, and I wanted to thank you first of all because you are uh, an Iranian artist, so we all proud of you all the time in Iran, and all artists like me, we all say that. So at the end, the, the end point, uh, if we can uh, come and we can uh, go further, maybe we can reach uh, to you and be instead of you maybe someday. <laughs> and so uh, just I, I want uh, to ask you about the time that you came back to Iran, the time that you said I started again uh, to do art, and I wanted to know um, what, which things uh, inspired you and that you started again to do art and to continue because uh, maybe it's uh, important for me, for other Iranian artists to do, to think uh, what things are important for you. It's a very excellent question I, and I, there's just so much information I didn't mention that. Um, again, I, when I went to Iran, I, I didn't have plans to make art. Uh, I, I felt like an outsider. I, I came and I almost felt like, and by this time I had a young son who was half Korean, and I, I went to Iran and I felt like a stranger, even to my own family. Uh, and I was blown away by the way their life had changed, uh, in, even in, internally in their private lives. Uh, and, and, and this alienation, was very painful for me because at this point I, I felt exhausted from my American curiosity and I felt that I, I, I needed urgently to be reunited with my family. And, and so I think the art, in a way, when I look back, became an excuse, uh, a way that every time I came back to New York and went back again, uh, I continued with the art in a way that I kept that fire alive, this, this relationship, this link. I started to read a lot uh, about the revolution. I started to talk to a lot of my friends who actually were part of the revolution because our generation are the one 
who brought the revolution. And, and somehow I felt a great sadness that if I came back, that I would be again cut off like before. And so if I couldn't bring them to to US, I, I tried to create this work that maintained that security that I would once again belong to that community. And eventually when I met Shoja and the other team of Iranian people, my life, life changed completely because I became completely immersed in Iranian community outside of Iran. And since then, I've never let that happen again. Uh, I think our community of artists that we work so collaboratively, it goes beyond just working as artists, but just a feeling of security, uh, a, a, something that we don't have anymore ever since we left. So it's a need, it's a personal need. Art, for me, probably would never have happened had it not been my feeling of pain that I guess I felt nostalgia, if you can call it. I think I would have never been an artist, seriously, if those things happen, didn't happen. I can't speak for other Iranian artists, why they should make art, why should it connect to Iran, but I can speak about my own experience. Hi, um, my name is Sophia Sachar. I'm an artist, uh, just recently graduated from the academy. Um, I have a very short question, a very small question for you. What, in your own words, what is the success? What is the success of an artist for you? What is your success? As you said in the beginning, that you studied studied from Berkeley and. Uh, a lot of art schools teach you that success is to get into a gallery and produce beautiful work, which is acceptable in galleries. But I feel that you started 10 years after, how many years after you graduated, and uh, I believe that your, uh, the, the photographs that you produced were, um, were not meant to be the beautiful work that uh, galleries are looking for, but you are a successful artist, so uh, if you could tell in your own words. Thank you. Well, there, it's, a, it's very good uh, you say that. I, I've learned one thing, never take criticism too seriously and never take praise too seriously, and, and learn not to compromise. Um, and I think we should always be at risk as artists to, to be too proud of ourselves or feel like um, at some point people try to make you believe something. And then that's very dangerous. And that's what I was talking about, that one of the reasons that I'm rebelling against every sequential work that I do is almost like intuitively I need to prove to myself that I'm still changing and I'm relevant because I can't lie to myself. I can lie to you. I can make up all kinds of stories about oh, I have done this and I've done that and this is so great. But I really, ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm by myself. And I have to feel that I can believe me in terms of there is an honesty in terms of what I do. And I, I have a lot of doubts about myself, my work. And I'm very lucky because I also have critics like Shoja and we, we critic ourselves before the work goes out into the world. And I think um, another thing is that I'm, I'm very, um, I believe in being distant from the art world as much as I am a part of the art world. I am a little bit worried about making only commodities and I make money from my art. I love being in good collections. I love having exhibitions, um, but I don't want to be reduced to only that because I appreciate the grassroots. I appreciate people who are not educated in art. I want my mother to see my art and appreciate it. Maybe that's too much to ask, but I don't think it is. I, I think we as artists need to set the parameters, not the art world. I think we as artists are following the dealers and the museums and, and all of the critics as opposed to them following us. And I think that we need to be radical in a way of saying, no, I can be more than that. Uh, I can be, uh, I, I, my, my role and my, my voice could be more important than just galleries and museums. I don't want to just be reduced to an art that can be at a collector's place. Uh, and I mean, these are just like, maybe it sounds like pretentious, but this is the parameters that I put myself, and also that we as artists can make very bad work, and that's okay. That we don't have to always make good work. Process is important, and, and, and I think this is something I tell myself sometimes I look back and I realize I really made some bad work. I mean, really bad work. Some of them are not bad, but in reality is that it's a process I've gone through. I've made mistakes, and we have to allow that. 
and, and the idea of success and the idea of climbing the ladders becomes really questionable. And, and I think the advantage I have now, when I'm in the film world, you know, and they don't like my film, I say, well, I'm just an artist. And when I'm an artist and they don't like my, my art, I say, you know what, I'm actually a filmmaker. I'm not really... So I think this being in between many things, it's actually really helpful because you feel some distance from everything and you're none of the above. Yes, I'm a friend of Susan Dehim, who I appreciate very much, and uh, also your whole legacy and story. What haven't you, in terms of your entire uh, scope of work, what haven't you expressed that you hope to maybe push to the forefront in your exploration of Um Kasum? Well, very good question. Um, I think, to be very honest, um, I have an obsession with other women artists, and Shahnoush is one. Uh, I've had um, obsession with other women writers that have used their literature overlaying the photographs, um, people who had great imaginations, but not only that, the lives that they lived in, uh, that I couldn't separate, like myself, I cannot separate my art from my personal life. Uh, I'm fascinated by women that, despite their difficult situations, have continued on and made fantastic work. I'm, I'm finding that as a phenomena, uh, how you can be a woman that basically the fragile in you and the emotional in you, um, but also live political life that is very difficult, uh, and also have a career and success and, you know. Uh, and I think, like in Shahnoush and her life, in prison that she lived, she lived, she spent a few years and the, the time that she endured and yet the fantastic imagination that she had. And later on um, with some of the other ladies, which uh, with this lady, I love to be under the skin of a woman that at once pe put people in that state of ecstasy and just f made them fall apart and had such a control over people's emotions. But on the other hand, she's known as a symbol, as a nationalist, and someone who fought for her country, for the notion of solidarity between the Arab countries. Uh, I just love the idea that art and politics are connecting in this single woman's voice. So I I in this single artist, and in a way through the study of Ome Kosum, you can actually study Egypt, modern Egypt. Um, and so to me, Ome Kosum embodies the history of Egypt in a very beautiful way, the rise and fall, the growth from being religious peasant girl who was dressed like a boy at the beginning to the life in Cairo and eventually being the patriot, you know. Um, and so these are things I look forward to because I have personally a lot of curiosity and I don't have the answers. <laughs> Am I taking one more question? Yeah, sure. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. It's, a, it's an honor to listen to you. Um, so I have a, a question. It's kind of forming, so it might sound a little bit weird, but I hope that um, it will be clear enough. It, at one moment during your uh, lecture, you talked about um, how you were creating work, and there was uh, maybe the word that you used was tourist, looking back at your old culture. And so I asked this as an immigrant myself, um, and how you deal with the complication of um, between ha of having a nomadic practice, and and but yet you know not becoming a tourist, or how do how do you deal with this this problem no, of of being nomadic but um, balancing that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean this is a very important question because a lot of um, Iranians even have asked this question of. Why so much obsession with Iran if you don't live in Iran, and et cetera? Uh, and my um, answer has been that my work is a piece of fiction. It's not, um, you know, it's never tried to depict reality. <clears throat> I'm not even able to, uh, to approach truth because I'm not even near the truth. I haven't even been able to go to Iran since 1996. So everything is a pure, uh, my imagination and my references 
uh, are, and my, my interest, my sources, are Iranian, Persian, Islamic. So aesthetically speaking, for example, as you can see, everything is sort of reinterpretation of the classic Islamic art. And so is the subject matters, because I am Iranian, and I have this unresolved relationship. But by no means, they're representative of truth. Um, they're basically iconography that I've brought forward from my cultural heritage that I'm entitled to, whether I live in Iran or not. And, and that's a big subject. Maybe we can go to it tomorrow. Um, but it's, it's something that has been disputed a lot. Even I've been attacked by many people thinking that I purposely do it to be controversial and sensational for the purpose of the fact that seems to be a, the sort of subject that the general audience are interested in. Anyway, I'm sure you're exhausted from hearing me. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>